this summer, uh, God, I have a question. And uh, lots of people have said lots of things to me about all of these messages. And I just want you to know, these aren't all the questions that we have. Uh, this is a series that could be done several times over through the course of years. And the questions that we have, are these the biggest ones or the only ones? By means, no way. Because there are people like, why did you pick that one? Why did you pick that one? Um, don't, we have those questions. They come up. They, they get raised. And today we're doing the question, why baptism? And I know from the very moment I even ask the question, there are people that are eager to find out what I'm going to say about how this turns out. Uh, because it's so confusing, I guess, in our world. Uh, it's easy to misunderstand what it is that, that, that baptism is about. Why would a church build a baptistry in their building? That's like crazy. You guys are weird. Um, we understand that whenever we are sharing God's word and we're telling the truth, that there's somebody that might respond to that. And we wouldn't want to wait a moment for that to take place. And so we're like, let's build a baptistry where that could take place and it could happen. But there's this tension of misunderstanding that happens. And there's two tensions that typically happen. One of the tensions is uh, the authority and upbringing that you have. Like where, what you learned from your past, where, what place you learned all of what you know about faith to this point, that's what you have. Your past upbringing. The idea of how did your church grow up? What denomination were you a part of? What did my parents teach me and model for me? What did the priest say? What did the pastor say? The tensions of upbringing convictions of what I think should happen and what I think shouldn't happen and putting my own opinions into all of that and this wrestling match of tension that we should have. And just so I can say this right up front, because um, I'm going to talk about immersion today because that's what we do and that's, that's what we see in Scripture. Those of you that have been sprinkled as an infant, can I just tell you this? Go and thank your parents and your grandparents for the foundation they set in you. They wanted you to know about God. Go thank them. Uh, in no way am I demoting or, or discerning anybody else's decision. I'm just grateful that somebody invested in you. I would say, go thank your parents. Go thank your grandparents. If they're not here, thank God that you had parents that initiated some sort of growth and development in your life. But we have this tension of upbringing. And then, on the opposite, we have this tension of what God's word actually says. Like the authority of scripture. We want to say it's the inerrant word of God. Except when I have an opinion about it. Like, when I, when I look at it and go, I don't think that's what it was really saying. Or in my opinion, I think it says that. When it doesn't say that, it says like clearly that's what it is. And so there's this tension that happens. And I just want to tell you today, it has been my prayer in all of these questions, and probably this one more than any one of them, because it's a theological question in regards to the foundation of our church and what New Testament churches are supposed to be about, that I realize this conflict is going to happen. I want you to know I've not been here 27 years because I don't care about you. I've, I've been here for 27 years because I do care about you. And, and that what I want to do is to bring everything I can, the light of God's truth, to every one of our spirits, including my own, reminding me again what God's word says to do. And I, I, do, I do so because I love you. And I would, I would want somebody who loves me to tell me the truth. Just, just tell me the truth. I just want to tell you the truth. And I'm, is it the only truth? I'm sure there's lots of truths to the things I'm going to share with you. That's not what I heard growing up. That's the tension we're talking about. But I want you to know I'm praying about what it is God might do in you and how you grew up and what you heard and that God's word would be real to you today. When I think about tradition and what we've learned in the past, I don't know about you, how many of you have ever had a Thanksgiving or a Christmas that was not feeling like Thanksgiving or Christmas just because of things that happened? Like you did it, you, did, you experienced it, but it wasn't like what you thought Christmas should be. Why? Because it wasn't tradition for you. Maybe on a Thanksgiving, you had tragedy happen, and you weren't able to have a Thanksgiving turkey, if that's your tradition. You weren't able to have a Thanksgiving turkey. And so you did it, and you ate it, and you had an experience, and it may have been sitting in a hospital, or sitting in the basement somewhere. You were traveling to Florida, and the whole time you're like, it's supposed to be cold during Thanksgiving. And you had this weird experience, and you had this tradition that got messed up. Now, let me just ask you this question. Did Thanksgiving still happen, even though you didn't celebrate it? the way you normally would. It was still on the calendar. It was still a day off. You still were traveling. It was still vacation. It was still like day off. Christmas the same way. It still happened even though it didn't happen the way you would like. And then here's the thing. Sometimes I think we look at this, this idea of baptism and we have these traditions that we have and the truth is still the truth. 
It's still the truth. Whether or not we want it to be or that we want it to be the way we'd like it to be, it's still the truth. And it's hard to discern taking words out that we don't want to belong there because we don't think that's what he meant by that. Who are we to do that? I mean, there were way bigger theologians than us looking at this stuff well before we got to look at it, deciding, as you heard from Drew, what belongs, what doesn't belong, what ought to be included, what not ought to be included. And so, why baptism? We have four things I'm going to run through, and they're pretty lengthy. We have a lot of verses of Scripture, and no way am I going to capture them all. got to feel like every week I'm telling you this. This is not everything there is to be found on this subject. I'm only giving you a portion of it. I'm only giving you the portion that I feel led to give you today. And so we could have six or eight more sermons on this, but we're not going to do that. So why baptism? First off, it was done by Jesus. Baptism was done by Jesus. Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 16. We're going to start with what Jesus did first because we follow what he did. 13 through 16 in Matthew chapter 3. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. Stop and read nothing else. He went to be baptized by John. Okay, Uh, But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. You do not need to come to me. And Jesus replied, let it be so, for it is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented, and as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went out of the water. Big question there. At the moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning on him, and... A voice from heaven saying, this is my son whom I love and whom I am well pleased. Here's the number one reason I would say baptism is a why baptism. Jesus did it. Uh, And we could say, okay, good, go home. You don't need to hear anything else. If Jesus did it and we want to follow him, then I want to do what Jesus did. End of story. We're done. For some of us, hearing Jesus being baptized might be brand new information for you. And for some of you who listen to us talk about the Savior who died for us and died to put all the sins on, why in the world would he need to come and be baptized? And so we need to go and ask that question. What am I going to do with this? I spend more time about this because sometimes we look at Jesus' baptism and think it's kind of a footnote to all the other stuff that he had. Like, that isn't really included. It was just kind of this side thing he did over here. But I think it's kind of important. Why would the perfect Son of God, who was sinless, sinless, feel the urge or the need to be baptized. Jesus is the dispenser of grace, not the receiver of grace. Why would he choose to be baptized and yet do it anyway? I just go, hmm. But here's the thing I understand. His family wasn't for it. How do I know that? John the Baptist is his cousin. And he goes to John the Baptist and his own cousin, his own family, and you know this happens to you too. Why? Because we have tradition, right? We have, but that's not what we think here. That's not what we taught. We didn't bring you up to think that way. Okay. We have tradition. His family wasn't for it. And John the Baptist says, as a cousin, I don't think I should be baptizing you. You should be baptizing me. Oh, yeah. John got it right. Good answer, young man. He was trying to deter him from being baptized. You shouldn't do this. Don't let me do this. He says, this is weird. Why would Jesus want me to baptize him? And Jesus answered with this. Let it be so now to fulfill all righteousness. What's righteousness? The right thing to do. Is not Jesus right already? Yes, but he wants to make sure everything's right. He wants to make all right right. I want to fulfill all righteousness. I want to live completely and wholly right. Not wholly, H-O-L, W-H-O-L, okay? Wholly right. And what I want you to see is that Jesus conversion experiences and a conversion experience because Jesus wasn't in doubt when he said okay I think I finally come to believe in myself and so I'm going to go ahead and die to myself in baptism it's not what Jesus did he demonstrated his dedication to his father's plan 30 years old he begins his public ministry Earthly ministry happens, and he did it publicly to demonstrate how dedicated he was to his own dad. Now, was God proud about that? You bet. God was proud about that. Being baptized, God opened up the heavens, and his Holy Spirit entered and descended like a dove. And we're going to get back to that text in a minute about this Holy Spirit coming at baptism thing, because it's there with Jesus. Jesus gets baptized, and the heavens open up, and the Holy Spirit comes. 
Jesus heard from his father to let him know how proud he was of him at this moment. And he was beginning this process for living for and dying for the world. Not like it hadn't already begun, like that's why we did the manger in Christmas, right? We knew he had come, but we waited for him to start until he was 30. When everything was all set and all the time was right, that's when he starts. It was a pretty huge moment. I just want you to know, in all the baptisms that I've ever said or been a part of, I've never seen a dove come into the picture at the moment when a baptism happens. It's the only time it's ever happened. Like, ooh, a dove, like Jesus. I've never seen it happen. Maybe it has, but it's never happened in my knowledge of seeing it happen. Descending like a dove, and he was so proud. How do we know he's not proud of us whenever we're baptized? Now, he doesn't say that. I don't don't hear the heavens open up and doves start to fly whenever someone's baptized in here. That'd be really weird really strange i'm not sure how we get the doves out but we can get the bats out i don't know how we get the doves out but we don't have that happen here what's the difference do does god really is god really proud of us i believe he is luke chapter 15 verse 10 says angels celebrate in the same way jesus says i tell you there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of god over one sinner who repents who transforms and changes his life from the spot where he was in to the spot where he's now going celebration happens by a team of God's special messengers because they just love the fact that someone's life has now been changed and transformed to follow after Christ. So why baptism? Because it's done by Jesus. The second thing I would see in regards to scripture is that it demonstrates humility. Baptism demonstrates humility. How in the world could it demonstrate humility? Well, first off, let me tell you this. It's intentional. It's intentional. It's not an afterthought for Jesus to go get done. Jesus wasn't walking down the path and he bumps into John and John happens to be doing some baptizing and go, hey, cool thing, let me go in and do that too. He intentionally made it happen. Where was he coming from? Galilee. Where was John? Baptizing in the Jordan. That's 60 miles away. Kind of an intentional idea. I'm going to walk to where John is and I'm going to be baptized by John. It's intentional. <clears throat> and he wasn't just like haphazarding, making it happen. It was intentional for him, and baptism is no different for us. You really mean to go through it. Like you choose it, you decide to do it. It's not an accident. You go like, well, I didn't mean to, but the other day I got baptized. I was like by this guy, and he baptized me. I didn't mean to just do it, and it kind of happened. No, you meant to do it. You thought about the action of doing it. It was intentional. It's a process of faith by accepting the truth, It's a change that takes place in you, and you say, I need to do that. But it also, in humility, it's a vulnerable spot for us. Holy cow, is it vulnerable. Think about the posture that you've watched us do in baptisms here. We take somebody in the water, and somebody goes in there with them, and we lower them backward into the water and bring them back up. Is that not vulnerable? Sorry, it is. That's just weird. We don't do that in a pool unless we, like, want to harm somebody. Back. Not we want to harm them. We want to harm them back. We want to get them back. We're going to do that to them. But I love this posture in the water. It means trusting someone that they'll actually bring you back up. And I've actually had people ask me that. Like before we get in, you're going to let me back up, aren't you? (laughs) Maybe. No, I do. One preacher used to say that I held them under until they bubbled. And that was kind of funny to me. I don't know how long it takes before they bubble. But... I, you know, to allow somebody to do that is a huge thing. And baptism by immersion is not humiliating at all. It's humbling. It's humbling. It's humbling to be lowered into the water in front of a lot of people or just two. And then someone's going to videotape it. They're going to take pictures of it and then hoop and holler when it's all over. It's vulnerable to do that. Place yourself in someone else's hands. And you come out of the water... Listen, nobody looks good after they're wet. Nobody. Mascara's running, your hair's all messed up, your clothes are all damp, and you're trying to figure out, like, why in the world do I have to wear this zip-up gown? It's, it, it's a humbling, vulnerable experience. And that's the point of immersion. You're choosing to die to yourself. And it's a wrestling match, like, I don't want to do this, and it's a scary moment, and yeah. Because it's death. And death makes it scary. You know, some of you are like horror film picture people. Like, I got to go see the next rip it up, Colin, like, 
uh, whatever with whatever instrument they kill him with. And you just know when the music's intense that something's going to happen. Like, and then it's a cat that jumps out and you freak out. The reality is there's something scary about death. It's not something we look forward to. In fact, we get to hospice and there, there's a lot of people that say, I'm not going to hospice to watch him die like that. Why? Because death is scary. We don't like to watch it. We don't want to experience it. We want to keep from making it happen. And I have never, ever, ever baptized somebody who wasn't nervous about it. They're jittery and anxious, and I'm okay with that. In fact, I would encourage it. And I'm not saying that because I'm wanting to be mean. It's just because it matters. And it's scary. When I say, you're going to put to death your past today in this moment, and they go, whoa, whoa, whoa scary and it shows that it really that you really care about it and it's a big thing in your life why wouldn't you get nervous about it isn't that how we do life about other things i mean don't your hands get kind of clammy when you get nervous and you get butterflies when you think about your wedding day i don't know about you but i probably didn't look the best of my like in my life on my wedding day some of you are like Whoa. Don't want to do that experience again. Why? Because it was nervy. It was, it, was, it was scary. Think about graduation and putting on a gown. And what if I fall on the stage and someone's going to laugh at me if I do something stupid up there? And then someone does something stupid up there. And you think, boy, I'm glad that wasn't me. Jittery and nervous. What about that big job interview? You don't want to mess up. Why would baptism be any different than that? Just so it's clear, anybody who's like thinking I'm making light of it, I'm not. It's huge what you're getting ready to do. It's huge. I understand the conflict that you have. I understand why you're nervous. You're publicly confessing Jesus as Lord, and you're publicly dying to yourself, and death is scary, and I'm okay with a little bit of nervousness. That's exactly the reason you should probably do it. Because you need to understand what it feels to feel like death is really coming upon you right now. Something's going to die. And it isn't going to be somebody else. It's going to be me. You need to feel that understand what that feels like it's the reason that you accept him and here here's the thing if you choose not to do that then you kind of want to live under the radar of what christ has asked you to do and if you want to live under the radar of that what else would you live under the radar with him on what else might be something like well i don't really want to do that because it's uncomfortable because it puts to death our pride and comforts our fears in acts chapter 16 which i'm not going to read today the philippian jailer and Paul and Silas, Paul and Silas are locked in jail with chains, and all of a sudden earthquake chains are dropped, jail is open, they're free to run, and they don't. They don't run away. Wow. That's a scary moment for the jailer, who then sticks around, they tell him a story about Christ Jesus, and the next thing you know, he's like, what is all this about? And this is what they say, and this is where we stop sometimes, where we just want to halt what Scripture has to say. It says, believe, and you will be saved. And we go, well, there, you only have to believe. That's true. But after they hear the whole story, it says, at once, the Philippian jailer and his family were baptized. At once, when he hears the word believe and be saved. See, our pride is the number one thing that gets in the way, and this Philippian jailer's pride had to be dropped. Why we don't respond to Jesus, it's our own pride. Because I don't want to mess up my hair. I didn't wear the right clothes. We talk ourselves out of it. I'm not ready for this. And when doubts get in our way, it starts to slow down what we're doing. And sometimes it minimizes what we believe is our faith. Just so we're clear, it's exactly what Jesus called us to. He called us to come to have faith in him. And if you didn't need faith, you wouldn't have doubt. Like, why do you need faith if you don't have any doubt about it? It's just there. He wants that wrestling match to happen. And so doubts are something that play a smaller role that inform us, that help to fuel the faith that we have later on in life. And they help to shrink it, and it gets lower. And once we've done it, we just kind of like, it's no big deal. Like, I'm telling you this, and I'm, I've been in there, whatever, 100 times. And the reality is, it's like no big deal to me. But it was a big deal to me when it first happened to me. Just like it's a big deal to you the first time it happened to you. There's a biblical sequence that happens and he believed and he was baptized at once. A third area in baptism. Baptism is commanded by Jesus. Matthew chapter 28, one that you hear around here a lot, a lot, the Great Commission, verses 19 and 20, therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always, even till the end of the age. 
And then we find another text in Mark chapter 16, same kind of thing. Verses 15 and 16 says this, Jesus said to them, go into all of the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Pretty clear words. We want to try to make them say what we want them to say. In fact, some of us will actually take this portion of the text out because it was an original manuscript written by Mark. Take this one out and just go with the other ones then. All right, if you don't like this one being included, take it out because you didn't think it was included in an original manuscript, which is what some historians say. Take that portion out, and there's still all the other verses you're going to have to contend with. And so obedience to God's word is huge. The Son, Jesus commands it. You're to go and to do these things. It's commanded. If I knew no other argument in regards to what I'm supposed to do, and that he told me to do so, if it's not good enough for me to know that he did it, that he told me to do so, it's enough of its importance to demonstrate it, John chapter 15, verse 14 says this, Jesus said, you are my friends if you do what I command you. How you doing on all that? Like, how you doing on that command? If I'm not talking to you about baptism, how are you doing on that command? Have you made any disciples recently? Have you invested teaching in them? How about have you baptized any of them? I'm not saying you should feel bad about that. I'm just saying he's commanded us to go and do that. He's not commanded me to go and do that. He's commanded us to go do that. You'll be hearing more about that later. We have been commissioned, like set apart. You are going to go do this. He calls his disciples to baptize them and to make it happen. But then we get all this discussion, and I say the word baptize, and here, unfortunately, what comes up. Is baptism a work? Like, in other words, do I have to be baptized? Isn't that something I'm doing to earn my salvation? Let's go with that for a minute. It could be viewed that I suppose it looks like a work because it's actually something that you're doing. But I would contend to ask this question. There are other things that say that you're supposed to do in order to be saved, okay? Believe is one of those. Does believing sometimes take work on your part to believe? More than just saying it. It's not like just internal. It's something I have to do all the time. My actions will actually follow that belief. What about uh, confession, which has also said something that will save us? Isn't that something you do? What about repentance. I bet there's some things in my life in sin-wise that I'm going to have to stop doing. That's going to be a work, and he wants me to repent of those things. And it's going to be a constant work, unfortunately, in our lives. Why would baptism be any different? And what about when we take all of that away, we look at what, what it says in regards to the sheep and the goat parable. What you did to the least of these, you did unto me. Prison, clothing, water, food, you didn't do it to them, you didn't do it to me, and if you haven't done it to me, you need to go over there. What do we do with that? It sounds like works to me. And I know I'm not trying to earn my way to heaven. What he's done on the cross, I don't have to earn. I don't have to earn what he did on the cross. But there are some things that he says, this is good for you to do. This is good for you to make happen. If all that doesn't work for you, look at Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. When the kindness and love of our God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. Okay, good. Stop. You could stop there and say, that's all I need. But it goes on. He saved us, not because of that. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Christ Jesus, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Okay. So I, what I decided to do was to pull all of the words together that talk about baptism and try to hand them all to you in one in one package and i want you to hear everything that god does in baptism that we have nothing to do with okay listen to the things that baptism does for us here's the list it begins with trust and faith in him and then it happens that we are united with christ especially in his death and resurrection we're united with him in the trinity the forgiveness or washing away of our sins a clear conscience death to sin the burial of the old nature, resurrection of the new life, the gift of the Holy Spirit, regeneration, renewing, rebirth, sanctification, and in short, salvation. All of those things happen, and just so we're clear, you do none of those things. I do none of those things. He does them all. So it is the work of God in us. In other words, it is not I who am baptized, it is Christ who baptizes me. Christ Jesus, and anybody says, well, I baptized him. No, you didn't. You were in the tank with him. You were in the water. You were in the pool with him. You didn't do anything. You did the act of baptism. You brought him down, and you raised him back up because you just can't do that on your own. We have somebody that actually does that for you. 
But the reality is you did not baptize them. Christ Jesus baptizes. He did the work for us. He saves us according to Titus 3.5. Christ does it, not us. We submit to it and make ourselves available for Christ to do his work in us. One more text. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. Baptism saves, cleanses, and changes our thoughts of self. This is what it says in verse 21. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves us also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Salvation means that God sent the worst version of you, and he put you in a watery grave, and God wants you to put to death who you were through Christ so that you can be resurrected with him as a new creation in Christ. And that's what it means to be a follower of Christ. Peter, no, no, that's, that, that's what it means to begin to be a follower of Christ. Peter seems pretty clear. Scripture is clear that through faith, that believing saves, confessing saves, repentance saves, and baptism saves. All right, last one here. It identifies you, baptism identifies you with Christ. We said this over and over again, but we'll say it again. It's a death, burial, and resurrection. Colossians chapter 3, verses 11 through 14. Oh, wrong page. Colossians 3, 11 through 14. Still wrong. Colossians chapter 2, 11 through 14. Try that. All right. Verse 11. In him you were not also circumcised in the putting off the sinful nature, not with circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all of your sins, having canceled the written code of its regulations that was against you that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. Paul says that when a believer is baptized, it's a tangible expression of that believer's death, burial, and resurrection. And water is the best symbol that we have for God's grace. Water cleanses things. It represents new life. It water purifies us. Now, when it comes to the... And just so we're clear, this is an Old Testament concept, so it's not like it's anything new. The priest had to go in and ceremonially cleanse before he could go in the temple. Other people had to wash themselves several times. Even when Jesus was telling someone to get their blind eye mud covered, go wash in a pool. How many times? How many times he said, go do that? Why? It's obedience to what it is I'm telling you. He was using some Old Testament versions of what happened, something they understood. Cleansing is something that we need to do. Now, look at Romans chapter 6. It's a rather long text. You're going to help me this way. I have it on the screen. And I have words highlighted, and I want you to understand the words you're going to say and express. You don't have to read the whole text with me, but I'd like you to just kind of emphasize those words with me if you could. These are things that Christ Jesus does in us. Look at verse 3 of Romans chapter 6. Or don't you know that all who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we've been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. And now if we died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. For we know that Christ was raised from the dead. He cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives of God, lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness, for sin shall not be your master because you are not under law, but under grace." It's a huge, huge text, but just so we're clear, the whole death, burial, and resurrection thing says that immersion is the only way. Now, this is where it gets conflictual for some of us with tradition. How do we identify with Christ? The word comes from two Greek words. First word is baptizo, which means to place under or immerse, and the word bapto, which means dip or sink. It wasn't a religious word in the first century. In the first century, it was a very practical word. It was used to describe anything that was submerged in liquid. And so whenever a ship would sink, it was uncommon for them to say, that ship got baptized. That would be weird for us in our language today. They'd be like, ooh, like, how do they do that thing to that? It just sunk. That's what we would say. But we'd also see that a piece of clothing might be put in bleach water, dunked and baptized in bleach water to cleanse it 
to take it back out. Baptizo, it would be putting the cloth in to dyeing it a different color and making it symbolic of what happens in your life. We're being plunged in and we're being cleansed and we're being changed. And it was a very practical term. It was a tangible way to say yes to Jesus. Tangible way. Now, we had the whole argument, like, what happens with the people who can't get in? They're not able to get in. They're not able to... uh, There's a whole other discussion about that, and I don't want to get into all that part, and we can talk about that later. The bottom line is, is God's just wanting you to say, I'm not going to dab myself in. I'm going to get in all the way. I'm going to be committed to you. I'm not going to be ankle deep in who you are. I'm going to follow you all the way. And so we are immersed, as Romans chapter 6, verse 4. And we also need to go public with it. Acts chapter... Uh, 2 verse 37 to 40 again you're going to hear that text read a lot around here Um, Acts chapter 2 verse 37 to 40 Peter brings the first of great messages that will come by Peter to a large audience and in verse 37 after he gives the message here's what everyone goes when the people heard this they were cut to the heart and to Peter the other apostles brothers what should we do what a great question What a great question that every follower of Christ needs to ask. What should we do? Go on. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Christ Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Ooh, there's that dove descending thing again. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom whom the Lord our God will call. So we have this text. Oh, wait. With other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted this message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to the number that day. It wasn't enough that they just got the content of what was going on. They had to ask the question. They were cut to the heart. You ever had one of those messages where you heard it, and you felt like your chest was being stepped on by an elephant? It's like, I feel like I need to do something about this. I get it. It's the Holy Spirit kind of moving in your life, like this is a move you need to make. Don't, don't, like, like, Thwart that. Don't don't shove that away. God's trying to speak to you. Let him. Allow him. And even the squirming in our seats today is some of that idea. Brothers, what shall we do? Ask that question. What shall we do? It's an awesome question. And it's important because it connects us with a community of faith. It makes us the church. This is the first place where the church is called the church. 3,000 people start to come and they start to make decisions for Christ. And they say, this is the church. You see it in several passages, though, that it's not a private thing that you have. It's a public thing. You could say, but I believe in God. That's great. When are you going to make it public that you do that? How do you do believing in public? How do you make it public? You speak it out loud. You live it out loud. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And some of us say that's all we need to do. That's true. It's one of the things we need to do. So it is a private faith. It has to go public. Jesus said this in a public way. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. If we confess, if you confess my name before men, I will confess your name before God the Father. In order for us to hear our name being spoken to God, we've got to say it out loud to him that we accept him. We go public with it. Here's the last thing I think is probably the most jittery thing for all of us. It doesn't mean you have to have it all worked out doesn't mean you have to have it all worked out. In Acts chapter 2, Peter preached, and spontaneously, 3,000 people said, I want that. And they're baptized. A group of 3,000 people. And I would have to think that not every question was answered. I know that not every sin would have been dealt with. I know that not every member had been consulted with them. I know that there would still be some loose ends in some people's lives. Many of them heard the message of Jesus that day, and they responded, and they were baptized. I want you to know this. You don't have to get all of your faith to get it all worked out. You just put your life and your trust in him to get baptized. You get baptized in the way that you lean into the power of God. Baptism is a gesture of trust in him. And I just want to say this because some of you are kind of holding out and really fooling, going all in for Jesus because you have some doubts. Somewhere in the long, along the line you've said, you know, I need to have all of my doubts resolved before I can give my life to Christ Jesus. And I would simply say, no, you don't. No, you don't. In any other arena of life, do you have all the doubts eliminated to make a sort of decision? Tell me that you have all of your doubts removed when you get married. I'm getting married to you and all my doubts are taken care of. I don't have to worry about anything anymore. By faith, I'm going to trust in this relationship. Right? Sure. What about all the other doubts that you have? You buy a house. Oh boy, is this the right one? 
What if I made a mistake? What's that noise happening? Is that something we're going to have to pay for? Why do you have doubts? You always have doubts. Maybe entering a friendship, somebody that you're going to be in friends with, you're going to have to go through those doubts. And as you go through them, your doubts get eliminated as your faith begins to fuel up and your heart gets opened up. I've said this before. Don't wait until you get yourself all cleaned up and then follow Jesus. Come to Jesus and he'll clean you up. Don't wait for all of your ducks to get in a row before you come to Jesus. Come to Jesus and he'll get your ducks in a row. I don't know what you're dealing with, ducks anyway, but come to Jesus with all of your junk, all of your stuff, and say, here I am. And he says, all right, let's walk together. We'll walk together and I'll answer your questions. We'll walk together and I'll speak to your intellect. We'll walk together and I'll dress your logic. Don't hold out because of a relationship with Jesus is a journey. It's not a decision or a transaction that you're going to make. It's a decision. And just like the Philippian jailer, he was baptized at once. He didn't wait. He didn't say, maybe one day in the future, when I get everything figured out, I'll get my family back to you and we'll get that done. He was baptized at once. In fact, the book of Acts has many stances where whole crowds of people resolved to say they were going to be baptized. In seven instances where they find specific individuals giving their lives to Christ at that moment. And one of them is the Philippian jailer. So as I close today, there are some of you that are here today. When it comes to this subject, you've gotten really good at talking yourself out of this moment. You've gotten really good at making excuses and saying, I'm just not ready today. Some of you have even managed to make them sound biblical at times. Today's the day where you need to say, you know what? I'm making this way too hard. I just need to respond to the biblical model and I need to do it. I know there are many of you in this room who have been contemplating giving your life to God and there are a number of barriers that stood in your way. You've talked yourself out of it over and over again. Today, it's no different. No more excuses, no more apologies, no more delay. See, today is the day that you rise above your fears and you face your insecurities and you swallow your pride. And in Acts chapter 22, verse 16, it was said this way, and now, why do you wait? Rise up and be baptized and wash away your sins by calling on his name. There's no good reason for you to leave here today feeling guilty because God offers you his grace. There's no reason for you to leave here today feeling defeated because God offers you his victory. There's no reason for you to leave here today feeling weak because God offers you strength. There's no good reason for you to have to leave here today wondering whether you stand with him or not because he offers you salvation. He offers you hope. What are you waiting for? And so I would say to you, not like Paul, not like Peter, not even like Jesus, let's go. Let's go. What are you waiting for? I'll be right here for anybody who makes a decision. Everything is ready. Your hair is going to go home wet, but what a story you'll have to tell them. You'll be able to explain why your mascara is running today. You'll have a story to tell them. I have been set free by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I've been washed and I've been cleaned and I've been purified and I belong to him now. I can't think of a better story you could have at lunch. There are others that just need a, a church home, a church family. And this time is a time when you can come and say yes to that. So we're going to stand and we're going to sing. And I'll be right here. Let's go. Let's go. What are you waiting for?